Wow. Um, usually I want to bolt off the stage as quick as I possibly can, but this is the one occasion where the three minutes are going to get stretched a bit because this room epitomizes um, America, Irish America, uh, what happened to me and just what's great about both our countries. Because gathered here is just the epitome of decency, hope, luck, talent, um, and I'll tell you for why. But just a quick, a, a quick sojourn. I'm on my way to the Oscars for In the Name of the Father. I'm in the, uh, the limo. It's my mom, my kids, everybody's gathered together there. And as we're going along, my ma looks out the window and she says, you know, Terry, this is great, but would you ever get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that's, that, that's kind of how I felt all my life. When am I going to get a real job here? I remember Billy Connolly and Christy Moore saying the same thing. One more, there's a point where you're waking up one morning and think, geez, this is what I actually do here. I haven't been, I haven't been bluffing. <laughs> but let me tell you just quickly the evolution of my story, which, which just epitomizes what's great about our spirit and great about this country and great about Ireland. I came here in 1981. As Neil said, I fled uh, the troubles at, the height, at its worst, at the end of the hunger strikes when things were bleakest. I came here, I loaded trucks, I bartended, I worked in Ohlone's Bar on 2nd Avenue when it was the, the folk rock uh, country and western epitome of uh, that music. Um, I, and then I got a job fact-checking at New York Magazine, courtesy of... Pete Hamill, one of the greatest Irish Americans. <laughs> and Michael Daly, uh, a great reporter. And I worked, for, I worked for those guys, and I worked for Jimmy Breslin. And if you haven't seen the HBO documentary, the Breslin Hamill documentary, it's just amazing. And it's a eulogy to the greatness of our, our talent. So I worked there, and at the same time I was writing stuff, and I, I got a job at the Irish Voice when it was just starting. Neil and Patricia gave me a job, and I was the music critic. <laughs> and I went around the bars in the Bronx and Queens and wrote about what was offered on any given night. And fam infamously, I wrote an article called The Casio for Christmas Disease which basically said that most of these bands had someone that was given the Casio organ for Christmas and then ended up in the bar. <laughs> and as Neil famously knows, there was a picket placed outside the Irish Voice by the Irish American Musicians Association. <laughs> so while I was doing that, I wrote a play uh, about an escape from Long Cash. And I went, to, I went to see another play one night called A Couple of Blackguards in the Village Vanguard, uh, in the village. And I literally went into the bathroom at half time, and the guy in the next stall to me says, what do you think of that? And I said, it was great. And it was Malachi McCord and Frank McCord <laughs> doing their thing. And the guy in the next stall was Jim Sheridan. <laughs> so when the play ended, I sort of said, you know, I've, 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 um, I've been doing a bit of writing myself, and and I expected the rejection. He said, ah, oh, Jim, Jim said, come along, you know, bring it down to the Irish Arts Centre and show it to me. So I go a week later to the Irish Arts Centre, which was then literally wooden benches on stalls and a stage and, and doors and God rest his soul, Sandy Boyer was in charge and, and Jim Sheridan was painting the stage black, except he was painting away from the edge. So he had painted himself into a circle. <laughs> And I said, hey, how are you doing? And, uh, and he walked across and he left footprints across and then footprints across the floor. And he read the play and he said, we'll put this on, I think. You know, it's good. So he hired an actor whose name I can't remember, who was the lead actor, who a week before we were to go on stage, and Kieran, because Kieran O'Reilly was in this play, Frank McCourt, Jim Sheridan, who was supposed to direct it, ended up in the lead 
because the guy from Connecticut wouldn't pay the train fare to come down. <laughs> and, um, and the tunnel uh, came up. And on any given night, it was going to change. Jim would just literally, I'd go in there. And I famously remember going in the night the New York Times reviewer was supposed to be there. And Sheridan had changed the whole thing into a musical. Literally him and <laughs> Frank, God rest his soul, were sitting in the corner singing, Ruby, don't take your love to town. And I'm like, <laughs> what, 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 what's going on? The Times is coming here tonight, Jim. What, 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 oh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and it ran for... I think it ran for six months, Karen, didn't it? It ran for a long time. There's a video somewhere. But anyway, at the end of it, so Jim said, listen, um, why don't we turn this into a film and we'll, we'll make it in here in the Irish Art Centre and we'll dig a hole and we do this and we do that. And, and I'm like, and I actually, talent agents or something had come and seen it and there had been whisperings about maybe this is a film and so forth. And I'm like, Jim, I, yeah, we can't make it in here. And, and he says, ah, oh, to hell with this. I'm going to have to do... Uh, the Christy Byrne autobiography. And I said, oh yeah, a drunken Irish paraplegic, that's going to be a big fucking hit. <laughs> <laughs> and a year and a half later, he contacted me and said, hey, do you want to go to the Oscars here or what? <laughs> but in the interim, and Patricia might remember this or not, in the interim, I had a meeting at Patricia's apartment. She had a book party for a book called Proved Innocent, which was Jerry Conlon's book. So I went along to the book party. I don't know, do you know this story? Well, but you don't know the end of this, because Jerry Conlon comes in, and we're there, and I see him, and he said, you're the guy who dragged me out of the Jack of, uh, the Jack of Hearts Club in Southampton, weren't you? This is 15 years later. <laughs> Literally, Jerry Conlon, I had been in this club in Southampton where he had been threatening people to get them shot by the IRA, and me and another Belfast guy dragged him out of the club. And he remembered it. And that was the amazing thing about Jerry. He had this amazing memory. And anyway, from that, from that encounter in Patricia's apartment and, meet, and gave, meeting with Gabriel Byrne, I then went on this road trip with Jerry Conlon where I drove him to Key West, tape recorded him, and drove him back again. And that became the basis of In the Name of the Father. So, Patricia, I have a rights check for you. And, <laughs> and then from that, the evolution from that, you know, I then went on to direct Some Mother's Son with Fanula, who initially that was supposed to be Angelica Houston and Helen Mirren. And I got a phone call in Coney Island, County Down, from Fanula saying, I'm the person to play that role. <laughs> and we were on the phone for half an hour, uh, screaming at each other, screaming that, no, I have to play this role. And then she sent me a videotape, which I, I hope to God I have somewhere. She just did an audition, and this, I'm like, this is it. You know, forget everybody else, it's Vanula. And we did Some Other Son together. Um, and, all th and then after that, I'm just tying up the connection in this room. After some other son, I went to work in Hollywood for a while. And I did a TV show called The District. And I talked to Commissioner O'Neill about this. And it was based on Jack Maple, the Deputy Commissioner of Police in New York, who changed this city and changed the world, literally, with Comstat. And all of that, that evolution, that then led to Hotel Rwanda. It's, for, for me to come from that circumstance, to be given the opportunity to, lead, to work with all the people in this room, Kieran, Neil, Patricia, Fanula, if I forgot your name, I apologize. It proves what America's about. This is the land of hope, the land of dreamers. I couldn't have even dreamed the possibility of this. Clearly my mother didn't when she says, would you get another job? <laughs> And then I was able to go back to Ireland and make a little film with my family outside our front door in Coney Island, County Town, and win an Oscar for that. Who would have thought? You know, and... <laughs> and some of it's luck, 
and some of it's some of it's talent or whatever, but a lot of it is the collective experience that we bring to that. You know, and today I live with my beautiful partner Rena from South Sudan. You know, and, and I go on to try and work about whether it's the Armenian genocide or a situation in China or in Africa to transmit the great sense of justice, humanism, passion and caring that our nation has to translate that into literature and into movement that we can lay the foundation for generations to come to say they can be great Irish Americans but they can be great citizens of the world. And I want to thank you all for being here because it means so much to me to be able to say this to all these people who, who were the ladder that I climbed up. Without them, without the Irish Art Centre, without Frank McCourt, Jim Sheridan, Niall O'Dowd, Patricia Hardy, all of you, Fanula, and we, we, I mean, we fought like cat and dogs and had the most wonderful time. It's hard to say you had a great time on a hunger strike movie, and then I had a, <laughs> and then I had an even better time on the genocide movie. It was fantastic. <laughs> but what a gift to be given by my culture and my people, and I want to thank you so much and thank. Uh, the, the Irish American Hall of Fame to be there. I wish to God my mother was alive today to see that. Thank you.